This movie we're watching was made using a photographic process almost a hundred years old. But in fact, the images we are seeing here are coming from this laser disc. This laser disc, virtually indestructible, it carries an incredible amount of information and allows for random access. Now, up until now, laser discs had very little to do with computers. But watch out, the lasers are coming. Next, on the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. Popular Computing, the authoritative microcomputer magazine from McGraw-Hill. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schiffe. This is Gary Kildall, and the subject today is laser discs and computers. Gary, we're watching this movie on a video disc player here, which some people would consider high technology, but the fact of the matter is this is a dinosaur. It's been a flop. They're not even making it anymore. How then is it that we can be talking about this great future of video discs and computers? Well, this is built like a phonograph record. It has a a stylus and grooves, and RCA built this to compete with the video cassette recorder market. Now, the phenomenal success of VCR has really led to the demise of the, this particular player, but laser storage is completely different. It starts with movies and it leads to computer controlled video, right once devices, and phenomenal storage densities for digital storage in a computer. It's uh, my favorite subject right now. <laughs> okay, we've got some spectacular examples of the marriage of laser disks and computers for you, looking at games, graphics, and data storage. First, let's take a look at the background, the technology of optical storage in this report. About the only similarities between optical and magnetic storage disks are their shape and the fact that they both feature random access of data. But the big difference is just how much data can be stored on each side of a 12-inch laser disk, one billion bytes, or about 50 to 20,000 pages of text. The enormous capacity of this medium does not come without some disadvantages, at least for the present. Laser disks are restricted to read-only or write-once-only applications, and their initial mastering costs are very high. Because the information spots are incredibly minute, about one-tenth the size of a particle of cigarette smoke, they must be produced in a clean room environment, much like that of a chip factory. The base material of the disk is polished glass, sealed with layers of coatings. A high-intensity laser beam is focused through an objective lens to mark the coating in small pits or bubbles, forming the digital code later read back by a low-energy laser. Like the technique used to make phonograph records, a master disc is struck from which a series of plates are formed. These are the molds for making copies. While the image source can vary, the disc stores information by scanning it, much like a television camera. An image gateway compresses the picture and enhances it for retrieval. With a high-resolution monitor, an excellent image can be recalled from thousands in storage in about eight seconds. The ubiquitous floppy disk is not yet an endangered species, but users might want to remember this. One five-inch laser disk can store as much information as 2,000 floppies. Joining us now is Jeffrey Tully of Pioneer Video, makers of video disc systems, and also Vladimir Langer of Sony, makers of compact discs for computer storage. Gary? You know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, storage uh, with uh, laser storage technology is my favorite subject, so I have to leave plenty of time for the guests you can to talk. Go, you can go first, <laughs> Gary. <laughs> uh, I wanted to mention, first of all, is to kind of define the two different areas we're going to talk about. One of them is the full-size laser disc, and this is the sort of thing we see movies on, for example. And then there's a smaller compact disc, which I have here in my pocket, that was built basically for audio. Now, both of these devices are capable of storing digital information. Uh, this full-size disc could hold as much as, say, a, a million and a half or a billion and a half uh, bytes of information, which is about the size of a law library. 
and the smaller one holds the equivalent of about 10 encyclopedias. Just on the one disc? Just on that one disc. Now this happens to be, this happens to be a disc that's a write once disc. It can be written one time. It's built by a company called Optical Disc Corporation, but most of these are, are read-only memories. Now, Vladimir has a, a, an interesting uh, device here, the Sony CD-ROM. I'd like to turn it over to Vladimir to explain <laughs> that. Um, the CD-ROM is basically a uh, disc which is manufactured by the same process as the audio compact disc. Uh, the only difference is that the CD-ROM is containing a digital data uh, purely for uh, computer processing. Uh, this innocent-looking disc uh, can uh, carry 540 megabytes of data. This particular disc has been pre-recorded. About 40% of the surface, single surface, has been used and it uh, contains the entire records of the 24th Olympiad in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now what about the drive that uh, holds this? Is, what, what are the characteristics of that particular drive? The particular drive is just a very simple mechanism, again identical to the uh, consumer mm -hmm. already uh, popular item, the CD compact disc. Uh, it's packaged in a five and quarter inch uh, floppy format, which is a box of about uh, eight inches deep. So it looks about like the floppy drive that you normally see on a small personal computer. Thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the price? It seems like it'd be very low price if we're talking about basically the same mechanism then as a computer, uh, as a uh, compact disc. Obviously, this this item is going to be marketed in the OEM market, which will be mm -hmm. uh, then the product will be incorporated in other manufacturer a product. We're talking about uh, a 50 cents a megabyte. So the cost is not in the technology, but it's mostly in the information that's uh, stored on that device. Exactly. Uh -huh. When, Vladimir, are we going to see a computer with this compact disk storage system in it? We are making the evaluation units available a uh, uh, first quarter of 1985, and uh, we expect uh, to have uh, a few major customers by a mid-85. Mm -hmm. So we'll see them actually in computer systems probably in the latter part of this uh, next year. Right. Mm -hmm. And the major advantage, again, over magnetic storage? The major advantage, of course, is that it's uh, virtually indestructible. Mm -hmm. And um, it's removable, which is a, you know, gives a, a system user tremendous value. Today, the high-capacity uh, disks are basically captive. The, the Winchester type of generation, they're sealed in a pure environment. This is a, a diskette which can be basically mishandled and still be perfect. Right. Now, even though this is a, is a read-only device, it can, its main purpose is really as a, as a so source of information rather than one that's going to be used for, say, archiving or backing up uh, data from the uh, main part of the computer system. Right? I think that the market still is defining its uh, application, mm -hmm. but there's okay. a tremendous opportunity. We, this particular product has caused a tremendous excitement in the Library of Congress or uh, various publishers. The educational market has, of course, uh, been anticipating uh, a tremendous uh, uh, growth and uh, need for high-capacity devices. It could really change the whole uh, uh, printing industry. Absolutely. In Let's turn to Jeff now. You've got all this wonderful, exciting-looking stuff here. And, and give me a description of what your system is. Okay. Uh, of course, you've talked a bit about the laser video disc player that can play movies. Uh, that's one of the components here, uh, the system. Uh, the second part here is a uh, microcomputer, uh, which is currently marketed by Pioneer in Japan. Uh, it's a format referred to as MSX, which is a uh, software and hardware standard that a number of Japanese manufacturers uh, have adopted. Uh, the unique features of Pioneer's version, however, is that it has built into it not only uh, a Z80 processor and a graphics processing chip, a keyboard, of course, and memory, uh, a cartridge slot for plugging in game programs, uh, but it also has a uh, connector on the back which plugs directly into the video disc player. Uh, it's also taking video uh, signals which come from the video disc player and combining the computer graphics and the video disc imagery on the screen. Uh, right now, for example, the Sega logo and the Astron belt, which is a game program we have running here, uh, that imagery is coming from the video disc. The push button, uh, push start button and so on is coming from the computer. It's a graphic overlay. Uh, and in fact, uh, before we uh, began talking here, we loaded the program which controls this game also from the video disc. It's on the Audio 2 channel uh, in a format very similar to what uh, other computers in the home would use an audio cassette. So you don't for. have to have a read-only memory uh, cartridge on this or a cassette or a floppy disk. The data comes right off of the disk itself. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So for distribution of games or conceivably uh, educational programs and that kind of thing, 
Uh, you are able to bring in <clears throat> all of the things that one would normally have with a computer, the computer graphics and so on. Uh, but you can now also bring um, motion and still frame pictures that are full television quality uh, and even combine those two on the screen. Okay, together. Jeff, before we run out of time, I want you to push start button like I'm okay. telling you to do it. Let's see what this looks like. All right. And tell us what you're doing as you do it. All right, we'll bring the audio up here from the coming through the computer. And you're seeing the spaceship move on the screen, which is under my control. That's a computer-generated graphic. The background spaceships and the sound effects, uh, the, the firing sound effects are computer-generated. The zooming sounds of the spaceships, when you hear them, are coming from the video disc. Now, one of the major advantages here is, is now that this is not just a linear movie that's playing, that the computer can actually go back and play sequences, replay sequences, and make branching decisions and play a, a segment that is, is not in, in the... Right. As a matter of fact, you'll notice order. here, when I got shot, that the shot coming from the spaceship mm -hmm. was computer-generated, so that scene could be played with or without uh, an aggressive enemy. Uh, he may move as a passive target, or I may be able to shoot at him, depending on which level right. of the game I'm playing at, the level of difficulty. Now, this is, a, this is showing us a game application, but there are hundreds of other applications where this kind of a computer system is hooked up with the video disks. For example, I guess educational applications would be one area. Can you, have you had any experience with that so far? Uh, currently, there are some look, uh, people looking at those kinds of applications. Of course, this system itself uh, uh, is only marketing uh, in Japan right now, and naturally, the publishers there, uh, there's been a very active laser disc uh, uh, industry there even before this system came out with uh, things like travel guides, uh, encyclopedias of birds and fish and insects and so on. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, the uh, education market has already seen the value of the video disc. Uh, and in, in, in the industrial market in the U.S., where more expensive and more sophisticated computers uh, are used connected with the video disc, there are uh, military simulators like tank gunnery uh, and any number of uh, very, very serious uh, educational mm -hmm. applications that are in use. Okay, we've seen one example of computer graphics overlaid on top of laser graphics. Now we're going to look at another laser system which not only has laser graphics, but artificial intelligence and speech recognition. So stand by as we get ready to play Thayer's Quest. Joining us now is Rick Dyer. Rick is president of RDI Video Systems, and Rick was the one responsible for Dragon's Lair. And joining Rick is Jay Eagle, executive vice president of Proton, and Jay is involved with the audio and video elements of Halcyon, an incredible new system we're going to see in just a moment. Before we get to Halcyon, though, we're going to take a look at another cutting-edge application of laser discs and computers, and Wendy Woods has the report. <laughs> You're looking at the world's first interactive video art game, created by artist Lynn Hirschman. Lorna is about a woman with agoraphobia who hasn't left her house in 20 years. She watches a lot of television, and in manipulating the video, the viewer begins to sense the repetitive and repressed nature of her life. Well, I think that the video disc as a technology is really exciting uh, because of the interactivity and the ability of a participant or a viewer to become active by playing with, with the technology. Lynn Hirschman is among the first artists to explore the laser disc as a creative medium. That's because the barriers of cost and availability of laser discs have locked many others out. I think as these things happen and people see what the possibilities are and how exciting a medium it really is and how, how much truer a cut of reality it will present, more people will do it and, and you know, they'll, they'll, uh, more, more of an audience will evolve. It always takes time. But then, again, being the first and being pioneering is real exciting, so you get that payoff, too. Reporting for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. Stuart, what, do you become an airline pilot, or what, what is this piece of headgear you have? No, actually, I'm about to communicate with this machine, Halcyon, we have out here. And you, okay. you get these guys to explain it, and then I'll talk to them. Good. Well, so far, we've talked about uh, two uses of laser storage technology. One is in, in video, in a shoot 'em up style game. The second one was in uh, mass storage with the CD-ROM. Uh, Rick has had a machine under development here for some time. I read about it in the technical press called the Halcyon, and I'd like to have him explain to us what he's got. House, Halcyon is basically, some, well, it's hard to communicate to some to the people that have never seen the product because there's nothing to relate to it. I guess the best way would be to use, uh, if, if you remember the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. There was a computer 
in that movie called Hal. And with Hal, you were able to, to talk to Hal. Hal could talk back to you. Hal would recognize your voice and say your name. Hal had intelligence. He could learn, and he could control functions uh, within his environment. And that's what Halcyon's all about. That's what okay, So the about. elements of Halcyon that uh, are similar to Hal, let's say, would be the speech recognition, the speech uh, synthesis, and uh, some form of uh, intelligence and learning? That's correct. Going on. OK, good. Now, how important is the laser disc component to this? Is the laser disc just carrying the pictures here or the logic? The, the laser disc is really carrying both. Um, it, it contains information uh, where how the computer is, is presenting you with situations you have to think and make the, the decisions as far as how you want to handle them. Okay, now this I understand is the very first time you're actually showing off Halcyon on television anywhere. Let's get going. Show me what this thing can do. Okay, I think maybe the first thing is we'll just turn him, turn him off and turn him on. Um, as, as you re remember, you were talking with Hal before, so now when, when we turn him on, all you have to do is say your name. He will recognize your voice and recognize who okay. you are. Okay. So. Welcome to Halcyon. Do you want to play Sayers Quest? Yes. Yes. If I have your voice print, please say your name or else press any key. Stuart. Nice to see you again, Stuart <laughs> Hefe. Can I call you Stuart? Yes. Yes. Okay, Pretty Stuart. Pretty impressive. A little bit Last familiar. <laughs> time you played Gears 4 was 764. It's referring to the last time. That's right. It's a high play. And I did pretty poorly. <laughs> yes. Yes. Please insert the list for part one of Sayers Quest. And now we'll see some pictures, Rick. You'll continue right where you left off. Okay. Okay. Now, what uh, what you've done is really combine some technologies that have really been around. Well, you've got uh, the recognition of speech, a uh, trainable speech recognizer is something that's available today, and also the speech synthesis is also something that's available. So you've combined in a package here that really makes a, a story and uh, uh, what is that unique part of it? Well, first of all, I think the speech recognition is the most advanced speech recognition that's ever been put on the marketplace. Yes, there has been speech recognition. There has never been speech recognition of the high caliber that this has. It has the ability to understand up to a 200-word vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Take this staff to the fairy circle in the forest and give it to the fairies. So, as you can okay, see... Now, now, that's me, sort of. I'm the character in this that's story. That's right. You're that character. And I've got, and I've got a choice now. Sorry, Hal. <laughs> Let's go to the forest clearing. One. What? One. Speak consistently, Stuart. One. Sir. Two. Two. Is that okay? I mean, <laughs> sure. I'll try this different story. Then. Oh, fellow. Who are you? Nigel the Huntsman. I know much of these woods. For example, I know that the crystal of Lothar will enable you to overcome the familiars. Come back sometime, and I'll share a story with you. So the character just gave you some information. OK, and we're not moving linearly through the story then, right? I mean, it's branching depending on what That's happens. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Say again. When you're talking, he's listening to you. <laughs> Sorry, Hal. You want me to unplug you so he yeah, can Yeah, sure. Hear I think we've gotten that plan okay. across. <laughs> now, what, uh, what sort of learning uh, goes on with uh, Halcyon? Uh, Halcyon learns what, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses, what you like. Um, and, and as you get involved in, in this adventure, uh, whatever it is, whether it's, uh, it's learning history or playing football or in a fantasy like this, uh, he will ask you questions and, uh, and, and learn about you. And, and as you go through time, and the more you interact with him, the more he learns about yeah, you as a personality. Is there, is there artificial, you were mentioning uh, uh, that there was some artificial intelligence use in, in the machine. Does it actually extrapolate or anything beyond uh, just beyond uh, Well, it asks questions from you, and it learns mm -hmm. based on your so answers. It recognizes the words that you've... Uh, now, each time that you, you come up, another user comes up, then you train it for a, se a separate set of words. Answer. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, when I was talking to it, it, it knew my history from the previous playing session to some degree. That's right. What applications are there? I mean, this is a fascinating, sophisticated adventure game, but what applications would there be for Halcyon beyond that? Um, I think maybe... I think that, that the relationship to uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey and the HAL 9000 computer 
is applicable here too for future applications of the technology because as Hal in the spaceship was able to control the environment in which he operated through communications and by the way communications were conversation with the human element the same thing will happen in Halcyon technology the next generation of uh, applications will clearly be communication between the user the consumer who operates Halcyon and the ability for Halcyon to control the audio video system open and close the doors that has a calendar clock built in so Halcyon, so for you're example, saying basically could, this, uh, is, this is the tip of the iceberg, that is a, this is the starting point. We certainly don't want to promote it as, as a HAL uh, or an AI machine in that sense. At this, at this point, what you're basically doing is, is getting things rolling in a, in a sense of speech well, recognition, Hal, Hal synthesis, already, and so forth. HAL already has the artificial intelligence. Uh, what Jay was referring to is that uh, HAL has already designed into him the ability to interface with any home computer or external peripheral or mm -hmm. device that he can control or get information from or give information to. Right. So it's available in real but now. For, but for the, in the sense right. of the what we call traditional AI, it really doesn't satisfy that criterion now. So it's a, a sense of, of real intelligence. Or would, would, I think that'd be fair to say, wouldn't it? I think to the degree that intelligence, intelligence is necessary for it to be useful in many ways to the consumer, it has real artificial intelligence. And in fact, to the point where what we tri typically think of as a robot, which is a little creature that goes around on wheels and sweeps dust off the, that kind of picture of a robot. Mm -hmm. This is a true robot. It, it serves the user in any number of ways that you choose to have it control or help you control your environment through conversation. Just That's the best kind of robot, <laughs> without wheels. It's a good, good, real good starting point. It's a very impressive mm -hmm. machine. Uh, briefly, we have about 30 seconds. There's a history <laughs> application you have on this. Explain that, Rick. Uh, the history is a voyage to the new world. It's about um, the history of John Cabot who lived in 1498, but you learn history by going back in time and actually becoming a part. You go on, you, you are on the ship. Mm -hmm. Okay, pretty fascinating Very stuff. Nice. Hal Xiong, we'll play with you and talk with you later. <laughs> now, how far will laser discs and computer technology go? We have some thoughts from commentator Paul Schindler. How far are laser discs going? Well, this one is gonna go into my compact disc player. I'm replacing my records with compact disks just as quickly as I can. And when laser disks become available as a computer peripheral, I'm going to start replacing my floppies. If you'd like a peek into the future of laser disks in the computer business, have a look at what compact disks are doing to the record business now. Let me show you. This is my current Brandenburg Concertos. It's an LP. There's a lot of noise on there besides the music. It's bulky. If I get my fingers on it, I ruin it, and it's only got 30 minutes of music on a side. This is my new compact disk version. And what a great name, it's so compact. Bach never sounded better. It's got an hour's worth of music, it doesn't matter if I put my fingers on it. Now this is the floppy disk that we're all familiar with. It's just like the LP. You can wear it out, if you get your fingers on it, you're gonna ruin it. I think laser disks are going to do to floppies what compact disks are doing to records, and that is to say it's going to replace them. But you can't write on a compact disk, you say. Well, by the 1990s, read, write, Laser disc units are going to make floppy disks just about as popular as punched paper tape is today. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, psst, want to buy a cheap PC Junior? You'll be hearing a lot of that these days as 300,000 PC Juniors join the ranks of the orphaned computers. IBM has announced it will stop production on the PC Junior, admitting failure in the low-price home market. IBM said it will continue to support the Junior. It was not clear whether Big Blue has in mind a new machine for the home market. Top view is IBM's new multi-window user interface, but a new startup in Oakland, California, says it has a new MS-DOS interface called Panorama, which tops Top View. A company called Dynamical Systems claims its new Panorama interface runs faster than top view, can handle 10 times more windows, and uses up only half the memory. Since IBM has refused to license top view to clone manufacturers, Panorama may be the answer for the compatibles seeking to stay competitive with the new IBM environment. Meanwhile, IBM is continuing its push into the software field with the entry of 22 new programs, all priced under $150, most priced under $20. The Japanese have finally agreed to protect U.S. software. Japan's computer industry had been holding out for only a 15-year copyright term and a compulsory license to Japanese companies. However, the new proposal allows for a 50-year software copyright in Japan with only limited domestic copying rights. 
The Japanese have been talking quite a bit about fifth generation computers and parallel processing as a way to improve computer power, but the good old USA has announced two of the first prototype parallel processing machines. IBM has unveiled an experimental computer called the Yorktown Simulation Engine, which uses 512 microprocessors. And Intel has announced its first concurrent computer using 256 microprocessors. Both machines are experimental. What may be the world's largest supercomputer center will be built at the NASA Ames Research Facility in Mountain View, California. NASA says the machines will be used to design spacecraft and study the universe. NASA officials say that within two years it will have supercomputers running ten times faster than anything known today. If you like to run fast, Paul Schindler is back with a look at a program called Coach. That's the sign for steel, and that means it's time to run, and I've got just the software package to help runners. It's called Be Your Own Coach, and it produces a workout schedule for runners that's sound and healthy. As a native Oregonian, I've got to tell you, this package was written in the running capital of the world, Eugene, Oregon. It gives you a choice of six different running programs, depending on your objectives. You tell it how far you run, how fast, and what your heart rate is. Be Your Own Coach tells you how far you should run, how fast you should run, and how many calories you're burning. Now, keep in mind, this program is for serious runners. If you get up every day and run the same two miles, it's not for you. But it can help manage a serious running program. Now, take a good look at this opening screen. It's the last color you're going to see. This is a serious, no-frills program. The entry screens are nothing fancy, like Joe Friday says, just the facts, ma'am. And the graphics are nothing to write home about. All this program does is help you. I like Be Your Own Coach. PCs should be helpful. The IBM PC and Apple versions of Be Your Own Coach cost $50. The Commodore version is $39 from Avant Garde in Eugene, Oregon. For random access, I'm Paul Schindler. By the way, the Keep Fit set seems to have just discovered computers. Both the March issues of Run and Running World magazines feature reviews of running and exercise software. One of those reviewed features aerobic music and exercising stick figures, perfect if you like to work out but don't like watching Jane Fonda. Kodak is continuing its move from the chemical world to the magnetic world. Kodak announced this past week its plans to acquire Verbatim, the floppy disk manufacturer. Kodak had been selling disks made by Dyson. Does conversion to computers in your business eliminate jobs? Apparently not, according to a new study by a Menlo Park firm. The study showed that a firm's recently converting to computers, 58% did not cut staff, and in fact 12% had to add staff. Finally, computers are showing up in an unlikely area, rock music. The new trendy thing is for rock groups to travel on the road with computers. Compacts, NECs, and PCs have been spotted in the dressing rooms of Rick Springfield, Todd Rundgren, Styx, Jefferson Starship, Journey, and Tina Turner. The computers are used to handle tour costs, travel arrangements, and for research on local radio stations. Now, if they would only get the computers to write the music, or do they? That's it for this week's Chronicles. See you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.